The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's webinar. Um, my name is Brianna Moore, and I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology at the UT School of Public Health in Austin. Um, my today's webinar is hosted by the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the School of Public Health here in Austin. The center's vision is healthy children in a healthy world. Um, before I start my, my webinar, my talk today, I want to make a few announcements. First, this webinar is being recorded, so if you want to uh, look at the slides or watch the presentation again, this will be at the website, msdcenter.org. And then um, also we have a question box on the side here, so if you have any questions as we go along, you can um, ask those, and Amelia will be filtering through those, and she will ask those at the end. So um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay. All right, so um, today I'm going to be talking about tobacco exposure and children's health, specifically identifying critical windows and joint effects. Um, just a little bit more background about myself. I'm an environmental epidemiologist. Uh, my background, I have a PhD in environmental health with a specialization in epi. I did my postdoctoral training in epi, and then now I'm an assistant professor at UT Health in Austin. My research really focuses on how early life exposures influence childhood growth and neurodevelopment. I focus a lot on tobacco, as the talk is focused on today, um, but I also look at cannabis exposure in childhood and pregnancy, uh, as well as air pollution and nutrition. So you'll see a little bit of that throughout this talk as well. Uh, just to give an outline of my talk today, I'm going to start by talking about tobacco exposure and childhood obesity. Uh, then I'll be talking about tobacco exposure and child childhood neurocognitive development. I'll talk a little bit about some future directions of how this research can be. And then next I'll talk about um, implications for this research, how this, what I found and others have found in the, in the past can be used to help inform policy and potential interventions in the future. So let's start with the first topic here, which is tobacco exposure and childhood obesity. I wanted to start actually with kind of an interesting, some interesting facts about tobacco. Um, you may or may not know this, but tobacco is a member of the nightshade family. So it's actually in the same family as uh, tomatoes, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants. Um, so interestingly enough, these foods actually also have nicotine in them, just like tobacco, but it's in a much lower concentration. So um, the amount of nicotine in a potato is or in, in one cigarette is 4,000 times as much as the nicotine found in a, a potato, but still kind of interesting and something you may not have known about tobacco. Um, more related to this talk is tobacco use among women in the US. So uh, men were obviously very heavily marketed to through, by tobacco companies, but starting in the 1920s, uh, women were marketed to very heavily by tobacco companies, beginning with, um, this is one of the earlier campaigns to women, uh, then um, that because of this successful marketing, uh, the prevalence of smoking among women uh, started to increase and it actually peaked in 1965 at about 34% of women. And uh, we don't have a lot of good statistics on how many women in pregnancy were smoking uh, throughout this time period, but we do know that as of 2016, only about 7% of women report smoking during pregnancy, which is great, but it is important to note that about 25% of women or more 
um, are exposed to secondhand smoke, even if they aren't smoker, smokers themselves. So uh, we've come a long way, but still quite a few women are still exposed or actively smoking during pregnancy. So that kind of sets up the background for why I'm interested in looking at maternal smoking during pregnancy on these outcomes. Um, you may be aware that smoking in pregnancy has been consistently linked to low birth weight. And this actually goes back to the 1970s was the first publication that noted this. Uh, interestingly enough, and kind of paradoxically, smoking is then related to uh, rapid catch-up growth, where basically in the early infancy, uh, child, uh, offspring who were exposed grow very rapidly, and that actually sets them on a course where they're at an increased risk for obesity in childhood. Um, there's some pretty well-established mechanisms for this, and I'll just talk about a few right now. Um, tobacco use in pregnancy, uh, because tobacco is a vasoconstrictor, it actually reduces the amount of oxygen and nutrients that can get to the fetus. So this leads to something called fetal hypoxia, where basically um, the fetus is deprived of, of nutrients and, and may be uh, subjected to inner, growth, inner uterine growth restriction. Um, and then other mechanisms, and here I'm kind of talking about a, a really novel new one, which is epigenetic modifications or inheritance. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this is the idea that uh, these exposures in pregnancy would make changes to like DNA methylation, um, or that the that these um, fetuses could escape that um, programming through um, inheritance. Both of these mechanisms and, and others as well can lead to low birth weight, as I've discussed, followed by this rapid catch-up growth and childhood obesity. And this growth chart here, this is actually BMI charted over time. And you can see that the dark line is the, act, the offspring that's exposed to smoking, whereas the dotted line are the unexposed. And you can see that, yes, they start out smaller, but then somewhere around a year, they catch up to the uh, non-exposed offspring and then they actually exceed that. So that really sets them on a course to be at an increased risk for obesity, as I've discussed. Um, at the same time, postnatal exposure to tobacco is also associated with uh, childhood adiposity. So um, this is also a common exposure. About 40% of children are exposed in the US. Um, this exposure is related to inflammation and oxidative stress in the children. And then um, there's some evidence that this could increase the risk for obesity by at least 30%. So it seems like there's a lot of pretty well established and consistent literature linking prenatal and uh, postnatal exposure to uh, childhood adiposity. But there are some gaps in the literature. Uh, one, importantly, one of them is that very few studies actually look at prenatal and postnatal exposures within the same study. This is really important to think about because a lot of uh, women who maybe smoke in pregnancy would continue smoking, um, but then there's also the thought that maybe they quit in pregnancy, but they smoke uh, after pregnancy or vice versa. So this is really an important gap in the literature because we don't know what the most susceptible developmental periods are. Um, so there's really a need here to apply a life course approach and look at exposures over time and how they relate to this outcome. Another important gap in the literature is the idea of joint effects. So this would be um, factors that could either enhance or mitigate the risk. So the first would be possibly concurrent exposure to air pollution, which may augment risk. Um, this might be because there's similar mechanisms involved through inflammation, oxidative stress. Another example would be this uh, altering the metabolic profile of adipose tissue in the, the fetal environment. So um, it's possible that having both exposures at the same time may be uh, increase that risk even more. On the other hand, early life nutrition may actually minimize the risk of secondhand smoke. So a great example of this might be breast milk. So breast milk on its own provides infants with all kinds of uh, nutrients we know. It also provides them with an, uh, anti-inflammatory and and antioxidant uh, protection, which might be really helpful for limiting the impact of secondhand smoke exposures in that early period. So um, setting it up a little bit further here with, with my research, I'm gonna be talking about the well-characterized cohort that I've been using for my research thus far, which is called the Healthy Start cohort. Um, Healthy Start is a cohort of four, about 1,400 mother-child pairs in Colorado. It's an ethically diverse population and it's spread throughout the uh, really just the Denver metro. Uh, 
Um, the great thing about this study is that we have seven repeated measures of secondhand smoke. So the study actually began, we recruited women, they were 17 weeks pregnant. We followed them through five years. Um, we're actually having them come back at eight to 12 years for another visit. Um, and each of these periods, we actually asked the mothers um, about their either exposure to secondhand smoke or if they were a smoker themselves. So we have a lot of rich data on that. We also have cotinine, which is the uh, metabolite of nicotine, uh, was measured in maternal urine at 27 weeks gestation and then at five years of age. So we kind of have a benefit here of having self-reported and biological markers of exposure to help um, minimize exposure misclassification. So now that I've kind of set up with the study that I'm looking at and, and, and all that, I'm going to talk about this first paper of mine, which is looking at critical windows of exposure. Um, and the research question here is really, does the association between exposure to tobacco on childhood adiposity depend on the timing of exposure? So let's talk first about how adiposity is measured. Um, BMI is a, which body mass index, uh, as you may be familiar, is a pretty crude measurement of uh, body fat percentage. But what we had in uh, Healthy Start is um, something called the P-Pod. It uses the, a, it, this chamber actually puts air into the chamber to um, directly assess fat mass and fat-free mass. So we're actually able to get an actual measurement of this. The benefit is it's not invasive. You can see this baby is perfectly content in the little pod. Um, and then using these measurements, we were able to, to determine adiposity, which is the proportion of fat mass divided by their total mass. Um, for this analysis, we focused on the outcomes of adiposity at five years, so their fat mass percentage at five years. But we also looked at the changes. So basically, if they had a really big increase in their fat mass percentage from birth through five years. The exciting thing about this research is that I got to use a new uh, approach. It's called the multiple informant model approach. And this helped to estimate the associations between exposure to tobacco with these outcomes over time. And again, the really important uh, aspect of this study was that we were able to, by adding a product term or interaction term between the exposure and the timing of the exposure, we were able to actually formally test whether these associations depended on timing. And just to take a little second here, I just want to emphasize that previous studies have uh, really focused on either one exposure over time, over the entire course of pregnancy, or the entire postnatal experience. Um, and it, it is worthwhile to look at these different um, exposure time points because we know that different things are happening in the fetus, in the child. Um, and it's also exciting because other exposure outcome relationships can think about it this way as well. So it's not just limited to tobacco and obesity. This could be applied to many other exposures and outcomes. So our results here indicated that children experienced increased adiposity at five years of age if um, the mother smoked preconception or at five months of age. So this figure really illustrates the risks over time. On the x-axis, you have the timing. So we've got everything from preconception up to five years of age. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have the difference in adiposity between the exposed and unexposed. So again, just to reiterate, at preconception, you can see that they had a, about a 2% increase in adiposity if the mother reported smoking before she was pregnant. Um, and then we also see a similar increase if the mother reported smoking at five months of age, so really early infancy. Um, our other results also indicated that uh, adiposity accretion, so the increase in adiposity between birth and five years of age was really significant if the mother smoked preconception or through delivery. Um, and our results indicated that this association depended on the timing of the exposure. So uh, just to take a quick second here as well, um, finding that it's very interesting that preconception was highlighted twice as an important critical window. Um, I think we don't often look at that period. It's, it's kind of hard to capture that in the data often, um, but I thought this was a really interesting um, finding. The other thing that's interesting about finding that smoking until delivery was a critical window. This could either be a proxy for very late smoking in pregnancy when maybe when the baby's really putting on a lot of um, fat mass at the end, because that's when they gain the most weight, or it could be a proxy for just smoking throughout the entire duration of pregnancy. Either way, I, I think that's really interesting. 
So just to wrap up this, um, this work, we found that fetal exposure to fetal or childhood exposure to tobacco immediately before pregnancy, during late gestation, like I said, either smoking throughout the whole pregnancy or just at that very last part when the infant is adding a lot of adiposity or in early infancy may have the greatest impact. Um, these results, I think there's some really great implications from this. First, it provides some novel insights about the mechanisms here. I kind of touched on the epigenetic inheritance but this is the idea that the oocyte, the immature egg cell, could be impacted by smoking before pregnancy. Um, it could also be structural or functional changes to the placenta. And again, this could really play a role in that late gestation when the placenta is still being um, utilized very heavily by the, the fetus, obviously. And then that uh, postnatal and behavioral changes, um, this could really be important for the why early infancy was identified and not later childhood. You know, the, the smaller the child, the infants have a much higher ventilation rate, so they're taking in a lot higher dose than even children who are exposed at the same level. They're going to actually have higher intakes of that, that nicotine and have higher copamine levels as well. And then um, the other important impact of this is that it could emphasize the need for smoking cessation to be extended all the way preconception through the early postpartum period um, when relapse is common. And I'll touch a little bit more on this at the end. Okay, next up, we can talk about some joint effects with air pollution. So air pollution on its own um, has been shown to be associated with low birth weight. So exposures here I'm talking about are traffic related and ambient air pollution sources such as PM 2.5 and ozone, although there's research to that looks at other uh, air pollutants as well. But these have been linked to low birth weight in many cohorts in the past. Conversely, though, in our cohort in Healthy Start, we actually found limited evidence that ozone and PM2.5 are related to birth weight or neonatal adiposity. Um, as I said, this is inconsistent with previous studies, and there are a few reasons that could explain this. Um, it could be that Denver actually generally has pretty low concentrations of air pollution. It could also be that there's pretty low variability across the Denver metro just because of the um, ge geographical features of, of Denver. But there's also the idea that maybe other factors may alter risk. So a colleague of mine has found that social factors may play a role here, that it's not just the environmental factors, it's also other um, neighborhood level characteristics going on. And then of course, there's the, the idea that tobacco may also play a role, which I'm gonna talk about now. So the research question here is whether the joint effect of fetal exposure to tobacco and ambient air pollution on childhood growth trajectories would be greater than would be expected due to the individual exposures alone. And that's a big mouthful to say, does, does one exposure depend on the other to influence childhood growth trajectories? So um, this is actually how we, in many, this is a pretty common approach to modeling um, air pollution over a large geographical area. So this graph here, or this uh, map here shows all the counties in Denver, or excuse me, the census tracts in Denver, all the black dots are the participants in our study, and they're pretty densely populated in the middle, but you can see we have a little bit of some spread here. The green squares are the ozone monitors, those are the EPA monitors that are stationary and they don't move, and same with the yellow triangles, those are the PM 2.5 monitors, which are actually pretty, um, pretty much located on the I-25 corridor, so um, not a lot of variability there, but that's what we used, and we used um, inverse distance weighting to determine exposure levels for all of these women throughout their whole pregnancy. We also narrowed it down to um, their trimester specific exposures over time, and then um, exposure was classified as high or low exposure based on tertiles. Um, so methods here are pretty straight straightforward. We used linear regression models for um, our adiposity outcomes, and then we used mixed effects models for our growth trajectories. And again, we used a product term between cotinine and our air pollutants to determine whether there was an interaction between the two. Our, um, our results indicated that offspring of the mothers with high exposure to PM 2.5 in the third trimester experienced no, no difference in birth weight or neonatal adiposity, which is again, kind of consistent with what we found in the study before. But what's really novel and interesting here is that we found that BMI growth was actually more rapid than would be expected to the individual exposures alone. So this figure here is a, is a growth trajectory. I've shown a few of these at this point. Um, 
but you can see that the dark, the dark, bold black line is those offspring who were exposed to both exposures, whereas the dotted lines are either no exposure or the PM 2.5, so there's really no difference there. And then tobacco only is the slightly uh, less bold black line. So again, the top line is really showing that even though they start at the same um, body mass index, they um, their growth really accelerates um, to the point where at three years, you can see quite a big difference in uh, BMI levels. Um, it's pretty substantial, actually. So um, the conclusions here are that uh, in the Denver Metro, PM 2.5 is actually generally below the EPA air quality standards. So this figure here is something you may be familiar with. These are the air quality index uh, standards by the EPA. They're sometimes on our weather apps. It tells us if it's a good day or a bad day for air pollution. And um, so a moderate level would be considered 12.1. And Denver is generally pretty well below that, more green days than anything else. Um, however, we still found that higher exposure, even in this good range, was associated with um, uh, accelerated BMI growth when combined with maternal smoking. So our results could imply that childhood obesity prevention could uh, benefit from targeting both of these exposures at the same time. So talking to women equally about their potential exposures to outdoor ambient air pollution as well as indoor smoking. So kind of hitting on indoor and outdoor air pollution, if you will. Okay, and then next up, I'm gonna talk about some joint effects with breastfeeding, which I talked about, I mentioned earlier. So breast, breast milk, as we know, um, supplies infants with uh, immune factors and um, all kinds of nutrients, omega-3s and plenty of other uh, wonderful things. However, when it comes to smoking, if the mother is a smoker, there is the potential that um, there would be an additional lactational exposure to nicotine and all the other chemicals in breast milk. So it's kind of unknown whether um, smoking, whether breastfeeding while the mother is smoking is a, a protective or an additional risk factor. So my research question here was really, does the association between postnatal exposure to secondhand smoke on infant adiposity depend on breastfeeding? So again, is there an interaction between the two where um, breastfeeding might protect against um, those exposures? So this might look familiar to you at this point. Um, we used PPOD to measure adiposity, but um, we also asked women at this five-year, excuse me, five-month visit, we asked the mothers to discuss if they were formula feeding, mixed feeding, or if they were exclusively breastfeeding. And um, I think it's really interesting and, and quite positive that only about 6% of women were reporting that they were formula feeding exclusively at um, five months. So um, I think that's great. Obviously, there's been a lot of work done in this area, and there's plenty of reasons why you would need to formula feed, but I, I think this is really encouraging. Um, another thing is that women reported um, household smokers at this time. We didn't actually ask them if they were smoking themselves while, preg were, while smoking, so that is a little bit of a, oh, excuse me, smoking while they were breastfeeding. Um, so that is a little bit of a caveat of this. And then again, we used PPOD to measure adiposity. So these results indicated that the association between secondhand smoke and infant adiposity differed by the infant feeding practices. So infants who were not breastfed, um, ex if they were exposed, that was associated with a one kilogram increase in fat mass, which if you think of how small an infant is, that is quite substantial. That's two extra pounds of fat mass. Um, but we found no difference in adiposity between the breastfed infants. So this is really suggesting that um, breastfeeding is protective despite the fact that they may be getting some additional lactational exposure. So I found that to be very hopeful, actually. Um, and so in conclusion, uh, this kind of goes along with my critical windows research where breastfeeding aligns, it's this five month window where it might be a really great opportunity for intervention. Uh, we know that smoking relapse is really common early in the postpartum period, um, but fortunately breastfeeding initiation can help prevent relapse. And then the longer a woman breastfeeds, the less likely she is to relapse. So it really would be, uh, I think, hugely beneficial to combine these into a, a targeted campaign um, or just again to maybe integrate these messaging in more during these well childhood visits when the mom is going in a lot um, just to further educate and promote you know positive uh, a positive environment for their offspring.
All right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and now talk about childhood neurocognitive development in relation to our early life exposure to tobacco. So tobacco is, uh, among other things, it's toxic to the fetal brain. Uh, the, the brain starts forming, it's forming very rapidly, obviously, at um, eight weeks gestation. So early on, uh, when things are being formed and all these synapses are being formed, that is a very susceptible period, but fetal exposure to tobacco may also overstimulate uh, nicotonic acetylcholine receptors. And these receptors are abundant in the brain, but they are also really heavily found in the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory and learning, as well as, the, as, well as the cerebellum, which is responsible for motor control. Um, so the research question here is that uh, previous studies have found links with uh, childhood neurocognitive development, but I really wanted to know, does fetal exposure to tobacco in impact childhood neurocognitive development independent of low birth weight and pre-birth, preterm birth? Um, and this is because a lot of studies actually include low birth weight, which may be a risk factor for um, these neurocognitive delays. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but that was my specific question. So in this paper, I explored the association between fetal exposure with Developmental milestones, this was measured through the ASQ or the Ages and Stages Questionnaire. Um, this isn't universally used um, across the, the country, but a lot of states implement this where, you, where um, mothers are asked to fill these out during their well child visits and fathers, excuse me. Um, and then we also looked at cognitive skills through uh, the NIH toolbox. It's a novel tool that has uh, different assessments for um, different aspects of uh, cognition, such as inhibitory control. And like I said, we restricted our analyses to offspring born um, greater than 37 weeks gestation, so full term, um, and then as well as birth weight greater than 2,500 grams, which is considered low birth weight. So we wanted to, to exclude those that may be at risk because um, low birth weight and preterm delivery could either be confounders or they could actually be mediators um, or along the causal path pathway. So our results here indicated that fetal exposure to tobacco um, was associated with delayed fine motor development at five years of age. Um, this is actually pretty huge. Uh, fine motor development in these early ages is, is things like drawing, coloring, using scissors. This is very important for developing skills needed for kindergarten, basically learning how to read and write, and um, having a really good command of fine motor skills is going to help children do well in school. And incidentally, fine motor skills is a strong predictor of later um, academic and performance, intelligence, and other cognitive skills. So really, um, this is a pretty big finding right here. We also found that offspring with fetal exposure to tobacco experienced reduced inhibitory control. So inhibitory control is the ability to turn off irrelevant tasks, so to be able to focus, and this is really going to be related a lot to attention. So the implications here are that um, having strong inhibitory control helps with fluid intelligence, which is more of the higher level learning. It's, it's more uh, <clears throat> related to problem solving skills and, and all of those things that help with um, not only academic performance, but, you know, later uh, cognitive skills. So these were two pretty big findings to come out of this study, especially given that these were all full-term and um, full-term infants and children who were not born uh, at a low birth weight, um, which really leads more to this idea of, of the mechanisms here. Um, we know that nicotine exposure to pregnancy is related to just an overall loss of gray and white brain matter, which could be related to these outcomes of fine motor skill, or uh, inhibitory control as well as other neurocognitive outcomes. But what's interesting is that low birth weight or smaller head circumference could actually be some sort of proxy for this loss of gray or white brain matter. So it's possible, as I mentioned earlier, it's possible that low birth weight may mediate this association. So this is a really, um, this would be really great to know and it's, it's something that I'm planning to, to look at in the future is whether uh, low birth weight is a mediator because this could help inform um, clinicians as they talk to people, if they know that the child was exposed to tobacco as well as was born low birth weight, they could really, um, this could be an early indicator and could help uh, get, uh, sorry, excuse me, it could help get some help for that child before um, before it leads to these 
more advanced uh, neurocognitive delays. And we know that stepping in earlier is always better. So that's something I'm really interested in looking at in the future. Um, and then the next steps when it comes to looking at the relationship between tobacco and neurocognitive development, I have a, a wonderful student who will be looking at the impact of tobacco on childhood behavior. Um, so this is gonna be a really new avenue to go down. She will also be looking at the critical windows of exposure. So similar to like I did with adiposity, she'll be looking at all the prenatal windows, all the postnatal windows to see perhaps if exposure matters more at any of these time points. And then she'll also be looking at the joint effect of tobacco with nutrition. So in particular, looking at folate exposure. Um, folate, as we know, is related to improved neurocognitive outcomes by itself. So we're wondering if um, folate intake can help mitigate the effects of tobacco exposure on neurocognitive outcome. All right, so now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about my the future directions of my research now that I'm kind of uh, heavily secured my myself in tobacco research. I'll be looking at a similar but related exposure, which is cannabis use during pregnancy on childhood growth and neurodevelopment. So just to give a little bit of background, cannabis use among pregnancy has been going up pretty steadily in the US, um, at least when it comes to self-reported use. So um, using PRANS, which is a national uh, questionnaire sent to women by state, um, they asked women about their past month use of cannabis. And of the states who have this data readily publicly available, you can see that um, the rates have really gone up pretty steadily. And I think we can expect this to go up even more as more and more states legalize cannabis for recreational use. And all of these states um, were, uh, these the some states have looked at it before it became legal, but most of these states are really measuring this now that it's becoming legal in in their states. So uh, cannabis use in pregnancy has been consistently linked to impaired neurodevelopment, dating all the way back to the 80s and 90s. But more recently, it's also been linked with low birth weight. So there's a reason, there's a possibility that could be related to the same growth pattern as tobacco, low birth weight, growth trajectory obesity later in life, but that's not known at the moment because we have very little research in this area. Um, it's also interesting to note that the effects of cannabis on some of these outcomes may actually be way stronger than what has been previously reported. Um, we know that THC potency has increased by six or seven times since the 1970s, so if there is a, a relationship, then that dose-response relationship is probably going to be a lot higher than what we've seen in previous studies. And I think a really important gap in the literature is that um, THC and CBD have not really been looked at um, by themselves. Uh, most studies have really looked at THC only, um, but they have opposing effects on the brain. CBD actually has maybe some neuroprotective properties, so it's just not clear if um, THC-free CBD uh, would be as detrimental to the fetal brain as THC. Um, so to address these gaps in the literature, I'm hoping to look at whether exposure to cannabis in pregnancy contributes to low birth weight followed by rapid catch-up growth, like I've mentioned. Also to find out what um, cognitive or behavioral uh, outcomes it could be related to. And then lastly, I really want to look into whether cannabinoids, uh, whether specific cannabinoids, THC, CBD, and plenty of other ones have opposing effects on, the, on either the growth outcomes or the neurodevelopmental outcomes. So as a part of an ongoing project I'm working on, I have THC, CBD, and nine other cannabinoids found in cannabis. Uh, there, those are being measured in stored urine samples taken in pregnancy, as well as umbilical cord tissue samples, uh, which is interesting because it actually captures the last two trimesters of pregnancy. The proposed study will be the first to disentangle the effects of THC and CBD on these outcomes. And I'm really hoping that this research can be used as preliminary data for some future NIDA grants, such as looking at epigenetics of substance use disorders, or to look at the effects of cannabis use on um, the developing fetal uh, childhood brain. Okay, so last, I kind of want to just wrap up with some implications of my research. First is, uh, I think both the critical windows aspect of my research, as well as the joint effects aspect of my research, really highlight um, the need for smoking cessation to possibly be extended to include all of these critical windows. So I, again, found it very interesting that the preconception window ended up being the 
um, ended up popping up multiple times as the earliest critical window of exposure. It makes sense. Uh, there's a lot of biological support for this, but generally I think we don't target this population because it's it's a little bit harder to reach this population. They aren't going to the doctor as much typically, um, but it really speaks to needing to just lower the smoking rate among people of childbearing age, regardless of their uh, pregnancy status at any given time. So I think really here, that's just continuing our efforts of smoking cessation across the board, rather than trying to find women who are in a preconception period. I think we just need to lower smoking prevalence in general. But then during pregnancy, uh, obviously this is a very key time for smoking cessation. Women are generally more light, more motivated to change their behavior for the better. They're gonna eat better diets, they try to uh, be active during pregnancy. Um, so generally this would be, this is a good time to intervene and smoking cessation is, uh, can be pretty, uh, can be pretty successful in pregnancy. Uh, but as I've mentioned, postpartum, a lot of those women may actually uh, return to smoking. So this would be a great time to intervene again during these well child visits, maybe tack it on when we're talking about breastfeeding. Um, but I think that's just a really big takeaway from my research is that it's really honing in on these periods that preconception through this early postpartum period is just the, the best time to intervene and to make a uh, positive change for future uh, for their child's health. And then secondly, I think another important area for uh, another important implication is policy, um, specifically expanding our pregnancy warning signage. So with tobacco and with, with smoking, we have very uh, well used and well documented signage, uh, but there's really a need here to require pregnancy warning signs to be displayed in, in dispensaries, for instance. So in the state of, of Washington, you can see their signage that they, they have in place. Other states also have signage, but in Colorado, here is the signage. And as you can see, there's one little line about women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, um, it just, I feel like it should be a little bit more uh, obvious and more um, easy to read. Um, this is actually usually a really sign in dispensary. So I think we could really work on that and just making it more uh, publicly known to people that pregnant women um, and nursing women should probably avoid cannabis until we just know a little bit more about it. So I think those would be the two big implications of my research. And I'm really hoping that uh, that I can continue with this research because I really enjoyed it and I'm excited to see where it takes me next. So I just wanna acknowledge my collaborators and just to say that I'm very thankful for uh, the grant support I've received over the years to do this research. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, now, um, oh, sorry. Quite a bit of questions. So um, okay. go ahead and ask our first one. Um, the Perfect, first question thank you. Ask, is there evidence that exposure to tobacco as a child can lead to allergies to nightshade plants? Oh, that is an excellent question. I have never thought about that. <laughs> That's fascinating. I, I'm really not sure. I know that there is a little bit of a link of, with tobacco and um, some food allergies and obviously asthma, but I have not thought about the nightshade aspect and I will write that down because I think that's fascinating. Thank you for the question. Um, our next question asked, where do so many chemicals that are said to be in tobacco come from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so nicotine obviously is in the tobacco plant itself, but a lot of the chemicals are coming from the, um, the processing of the tobacco plant. Um, and then some of the, there's a lot of PM 2.5 in tobacco smoke and that's coming from the combustion. So it's a combination of basically how that is processed the chemicals that are put in it to preserve it. Um, and then I didn't talk about e-cigarettes today, but there's a lot of research in the like the flavorings. There's a lot of chemicals in that as well as leaching of the metal into the uh, vape fluid. So really just a lot of sources, but I would say mostly just the, um, the combustion itself as well as the uh, processing of the plant. Great question. Okay, our next question asks, um, referring to the tobacco exposure, do we have any idea how many months or years of preconception? 
<clears throat> That's a great question. So uh, for our specific study, we just looked at the, we asked them about the three months prior to, to finding out that they were pregnant. So pretty narrow window there. Um, I'm not really sure actually how far out that would go uh, because the, you know, epigenetic inheritance, that idea might be even further. You know, you're born, women are born with all the eggs they have at birth. So it could actually be potentially way before that. But we just, we didn't ask that far back. So that's a great question. Okay, our next question asks, in the study conducted in Denver, did all the females have the same jobs? Did any of them work in processing facilities? That's an excellent question. I think a biggest, one of the biggest critiques of our uh, study looking at air pollution, um, and this is common for a lot of studies if, so as I mentioned, we measured air pollution by looking at their proximity to these air pollution monitors. So we did not take into account, we all, we all we based it on was where they live, essentially. We didn't take into account how often they're in the home, their exposures in the house, because um, you can be exposed pretty heavily to chemicals in your own home. We didn't ask them about their occupation, how far they commute, how long they commute every day. So uh, really we didn't get at this microenvironment like you're like you're saying. So we don't actually know any other potential exposures. All we really know is their average exposure at their house so that's a huge caveat of this research. So um, great question. Okay, our next question asks, how many babies were not full term due to mom smoking? Um, no, we actually didn't have that many. That's a great question. There weren't a whole lot of uh, preterm low birth weight babies in general, but we did, um, I think in that particular study, uh, the sample size got quite small, but we probably lost about um, 5% um, due to low birth weight. All right. Um, so our next question asks, it says, I smoked at some point in all four of my pregnancies and all four were eight to 10 pounds. Two were 42 weeks, two were born at 40 weeks. Is this something associated in a certain percentage of kids? So far, none of mine have had no motor skill issues or behavioral issues. Oh, that's excellent. Um, yeah, so we know that generally when it comes to smoking, um, any any time that you quit smoking is positive. I mean, the benefits are almost immediately when you stop smoking. And the same would be for your child and for your uh, fetus. So any, any reduction in smoking, there's a clear dose response relationship. So there's a big difference between smoking one cigarette a day versus a pack a day, that has a huge impact on the uh, the offspring. And actually, in fact, I'm, I'm looking a lot at neurocognitive outcomes. Um, smoking more than 10 cigarettes a day throughout pregnancy is much more strongly related to these outcomes than smoking less than that. So I would say the way you phrased it, you said that you smoked at some point, so maybe you weren't smoking the entire duration. And I think that's kind of what my research actually showed was that sustained heavy smoking is gonna be most strongly related to this. Um, uh, but then again, you know, this might also speak to things that you're doing after pregnancy that could be having a positive impact on your offspring. So, um, like I said, diet and plenty of these other things can have an impact, even if you um, did. And, and sometimes we can't avoid exposures, right? Sometimes you might have been exposed to smoking in pregnancy. Um, there's the I think the the encouraging thing here is that there's things you can do to mitigate that risk. So um, I would say that that. I, I don't know, I don't know your specific situation, but I think I view this all as a positive <laughs> myself, so. All right, um, our next question asks, what is the significance of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor activation? Oh, so um, these are receptors that are very, um, Obviously, they're very, uh, I don't, why, am I, why am I struggling with the word? They're very responsive to nicotine. And so when they get overstimulated, that could just essentially rewire parts of the brain uh, just to be very um, loose about it. But it, essentially, it's going to change the, the way that you process stimuli, for instance. Um, your motor control may not be quite as, there's a pretty big link actually between smoking and reducing the risk of Parkinson's, for instance, but the reverse might be true for children. So it's it's not completely clear, but we know that a lot of times when the brain is developing and you start messing with um, the the connectivity or the, the receptors here, once you turn on these receptors, sometimes they have a hard time turning back off, if that makes sense. So overstimulating them is uh, not gonna set the child up for success when it comes to 
their fine motor skills or their uh, cognitive abilities. Okay, um, our next question asks, have you looked at children exposed in the 1960s and 1970s? That is a fantastic question. Um, I love that question too, because we know that the cigarettes today are different than they were back then, kind of getting to this whole idea of the processing and flavorings and stuff of modern cigarettes. Um, no, I have not, but I think that would be really interesting. And um, it also kind of maybe goes hand in hand with cannabis where it, we could be seeing a stronger effect now than we did back then because maybe they weren't quite as potent. I'm just really not sure, but I, I think that's really, that's a great question. And if I had that data, I would. <laughs> Okay, um, our next question asks, have you considered the impact of vaping on these factors? Is this a possible future research area since this is a hot topic? Oh, excellent question. I love that question. I was gonna have a whole slide about vaping. Um, unfortunately, we didn't ask women about vaping. And the problem is if we didn't ask them to self-report vaping, we can't actually distinguish. We're working on it now or I, there's a group uh, I'm involved with that's trying to basically figure out if we can use biomarkers to determine if they were um, using cigarettes or e-cigarettes, but unfortunately we can't um, because they both have nicotine, so they're both going to show these same chemicals um, in their urine and blood. So um, I would love to look at the impact of vaping because I actually think this is going to be a, a, a very big emerging problem given that um, vaping is going up. But again, we really don't have a lot of data on how many women are actually exclusively vaping. We have some data on dual users, so if they're using cigarettes and e-cigarettes, but we don't have a whole lot of, I think it's a big gap, and I think you're right that that should be looked into more, but unfortunately we don't have the data. Um, I think people are just now getting getting that data, and it'll be a while till we kind of get some answers there, but great question. All right, um, our next question asks, um, are the nicotine and cannabis studies controlled for other demographics like SES? Also, for cannabis, any difference in ingestion methods such as smoke, vape, or edible? Excellent question. So I, I probably should have shown all along um, the factors that I adjusted for, but generally I adjusted for the infant sex because that's gonna have a big, a big impact on both um, their growth and their neurodevelopment. Um, generally looked at ma maternal education as an indicator of socioeconomic status. Um, plenty of others. So for the, the air pollution studies, we looked at temperature, air temperature, birth season, things like that that might have an influence. So we did take into consideration uh, confounders and adjusted for those in, in the analyses. Um, to answer your question about cannabis and the mode of ingestion, that is great. Um, big caveat is we actually didn't ask the, the mothers about their self-reported cannabis use either. So um, I won't be able to look at that at this point, but there is some opportunity maybe in the future to look at um, whether, like you said, edible or um, dabbing or other methods of use, because I think um, we're actually seeing in some studies are indicating that there's there's less um, actual smoking and more use of edibles, which um, the good thing is there's not the combustion aspect, but the bad thing is that there might actually be a higher dose. Um, although Colorado has, um, Colorado kind of leads the way, and I know the most about Col Colorado uh, legislation when it comes to that, but they've actually, um, they have very strict laws now about um, standardizing the dose so that it's the same across all products. So there's that. But it's still good to know, and those are really great questions, and I'd, I'd like to look into that in the future, but I just don't have that data right now. Okay, um, our next question asks, now I'm curious as to whether maternal drinking of alcohol preconception is also toxic. Is there any research on this? Um, yes, actually, um, a lot of research in the past has actually looked at um, all, I will say all, it, it, a lot of studies that were actually designed to look at tobacco, cannabis, and or alcohol altogether. So I think that's actually a really big benefit of my research is that I'm focusing on one exposure at a time rather than all these together. Um, they do tend to cluster together, but not always. And I think there's a big difference between tobacco and alcohol. Um, alcohol can be associated with some of these, but I, it's obviously associated with its own set of outcomes. Um, and then a lot of the behavioral outcomes, I believe, have been linked with alcohol. I'm not as much of an expert in that field and um, we did not ask about alcohol in our study, so I, I can't, that's not something I can really explore 
um, right now, but I do think that's interesting, especially given that it do, these factors do kind of cluster together. And then I will say, um, I do, if I have enough people, I, it just depends. Um, I'd like to look at uh, co-use basically of tobacco and cannabis, because I think that would be interesting as well. All right, um, our next question asks, has there been any work at the epigenetic level to assess whether women whose mother smoked have had uh, fertility challenges later in life? Um, I think that's a great question. I, I have not looked a whole lot at reproductive outcomes myself, but I believe there is a link um, with um, smoking and pregnancy on fertility of the offspring. I mean, there's just a lot of research anyway on, you know, uh, generational influences of of exposures. I mean, we know that diet is generationally, if there's a, uh, sorry, I'm talking, I'm thinking about the Dutch famine. Basically, uh, they found that those mothers who were um, uh, essentially starved through the Dutch famine, they their grandchildren were were still demonstrating effects of that. So I think there's reason to believe that. However, I always want to spin this and make it positive that Yes, there may be some epigenetic modifications, but that doesn't mean that there's not some point where you can quote break the cycle. So even if you have been exposed or um, you smoked yourself or whatever, there's always opportunity to either reduce your exposure, reduce your use, or to and or to um, also uh, look into some of these uh, protective factors like diet to mitigate that risk. So um, even if there is a link, I think just I want to reiterate that I don't mean to be so negative. I think epidemiology can do that because we focus on the bad a lot. Um, I think there is some positive here that there are some things you can do to kind of quote break that cycle again. Okay, um, our next question asks, are you looking at long term exposure to children such as mom smoked through entire pregnancy through age 18? Um, as I think you believe, I think you're talking about as it pertains to these outcomes. So that would be the hope actually, is to look at sustained smoking throughout this whole period versus, um, you know, smoking intermittently throughout these or smoking only in pregnancy and not childhood, et cetera. Um, our hope is actually, we're following the children till they're eight to 12. I didn't mention this, but uh, Healthy Start is a cohort that's part of the ECHO Consortium. And this is actually a synthetic cohort of multiple cohorts all across the U.S. representing, I think, 30,000 children. And um, so that'll be a really great resource. And the hope is that these children will be followed until uh, late adolescence. So right now they're in the phase where, in our study anyway, they're 8 to 12, but the hope would be to keep going until they get to be um, or, uh, late adolescence and really just approaching uh, parenthood themselves. So um, that would be really great to go full circle with that, but we'll see. <laughs> That's kind of ambitious at this point. Okay, um, next question asks, how does it work if vaping at a zero to three milligrams of nicotine? Oh, so, um, I, I think you're meaning uh, perhaps like what your dose would be um, and the effects that it might have. So when we look at the dose, well, in my study anyway, I've always focused on either no exposure, any exposure, which is a cutoff of 0 0.05 nanograms per milliliter, um, which just means that's how much cotinine was found in your urine. So as far as like the how much that translates to, uh, I'll say this, 30 nanograms per milliliter is usually what we define as a, an active smoker. So anywhere from 0 0.05 to 30 would be kind of either light smoking or secondhand smoke versus 30 would be um, active smoking. So um, I don't know about the specifics because again, it just depends on how your body metabolizes it um, or how, how that's metabolized, what's actually gonna get to you and then how that affects your own body, your own body chemistry, all of that. So I'm um, not really sure how to answer that question, but just that um, there's a clear dose response relationship with all of this and uh, the less nicotine, the better. <laughs> All right, um, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Uh, this question asks, did you notice any differences in adiposity based on the race and or ethnicity of the mothers in your study? Um, that is an excellent question. I I did not look at that. I, I actually tend to stay away from looking at that because I um, ultimately, you know, that's not something you can change. I like to really focus on 
um, diet, like I said, because that's something that you can change. Um, that's your external environment. I also really like to focus on education because, um, you know, your 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 uh, income level is pretty fluid, but your education tends to be kind of fixed. And again, uh, I think when you have the knowledge at your fingertips, you're going to make better decisions for yourself, for your offspring, for those around you. So I really like to focus on that because that's something that can be um, changed. And that's something that we can there are some actual implications for that. And when I when I go to do my research, I want to make sure that I'm studying something that can actually have a clinical or public health impact. Um, I don't want to just study something just to study it. So um, I'm, I'm certain that there is, especially given uh, different biochemistries uh, in different racial ethnic groups. There's a lot of literature on that. I just have tended to focus on, again, diet and education because I like the idea of having these modifiable risk factors that we can, um, we can uh, work on. Um, there was just one quick follow up to just that previous question asking, um, is there, but is there racial and ethnic diversity in the cohort? Oh, yes, yes, there is. Um, we, we worked to make sure that it was fairly uh, ethnically and racially diverse in our cohort and also had a pretty good representation of income as well. Sorry, <laughs> if I misunderstood. <laughs> Okay, um, that was actually it for our questions, Dr. Moore, unless any more happen to come through. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, attending. I really had a pleasure speaking with you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me if you want to follow up about anything. Um, again, thank you so much. And come to the rest of the uh, Dell talks. <laughs>